Hi guys, how are you? It's Way from Revolution from The Rake Magazine. Here with one of the guys that you've probably seen in, in, in the magazine, in both magazines quite frequently, uh, and for a very good reason. He's one of the guys that I, I know who is one of, uh, one of the world's most eloquent and knowledgeable experts in both all things tutorial and all things horological. Um, and he is, in addition to that, a very, very dear friend. So I present to you my buddy, Ahmed Shari Rahman. Thank you, Wei. Uh, absolute pleasure uh, to be here. And more than that, an absolute privilege to have this chance uh, to speak about things which are very close to my heart, uh, to such a dear friend who I think you know, gives me much more credit than I deserve, for sure. So just to give a little bit of background on myself, I'm originally from Bangladesh, I grew up there, came over here a fair few years ago, to London that is, mainly because of work, and work involves marketing clothing, which is basically what my profession is. You know, what I say is that you, you have to practice what you preach, Indeed. which is why I like to also wear nice clothes. Sort of develop my own I would like to think so, develop my own sense of style over the years as we've, as we've progressed on and I've yes. become older. Indeed. Yeah. So maybe we'll talk about watches. Um, I know you have a great affection for one of the sort of, well, probably the most mythical brand in all of uh, Swiss horology, Patek Philippe. So let's talk about the watch on your wrist. Um, I know that you have an affection for 5970s. I do. Which for those of you, well, I'm sure you guys know, but that's a perpetual calendar chronograph mm -hmm. using the Lemania 2310 as its base, correct? Mm -hmm. That's and right. I think it's the uh, the second of the paddocks that has, has used that as its base. Is that yes, correct? Because the three nine seven zero used it. Three nine seven zero used it first, and then they have obviously moved it up to the fifty nine seventy with yeah. a slightly larger case size. Now I, I always love this watch because this this from what I understand um, it was Thierry Stern's his first sort of um, project where he was project. he was given the helm of this project and said, okay, now design the successor to the thirty nine seventy, uh -huh. which had been a very successful watch. And I think that he basically just smashed it. He knocked it out of the park because I think it's, that's probably the most beautiful modern perpetual calendar chronograph in, in, in paddock or even Swiss watchmaking lore. It is, and, and that is one of the reasons why I absolutely love the 5970. The other reason why is because I think that in many ways for modern paddock, perpetual chronographs, yeah. the 5970 for me yes. in many ways has the perfect proportions. I agree. It's, it's a 40 millimeter case, yes. but it balances the thickness and the size of the watch really perfectly. Nothing to do with the fact that uh, the 3970 is an equally beautiful watch but uh, just for me I just find it to be slightly smaller yeah. and being a perpetual calendar chronograph yes. I find the dial to be that much more busier. It's a phenomenal watch. Now this is the last use, use of the uh, CH27 in Paddock speak and, yeah. and then Lemania speak the 2310. 2310. Um, but then they transition to a new in-house movement and I know that you have a very interesting watch because that is the split second version of mm -hmm. that watch. Again and the split second chronograph is very quintessentially Patek in yes. many ways. Yes. It's it's one of the larger split second chronographs from Patek, keeping in mind the previous uh, well, not the previous, the one which is still in the catalogue, I think, is uh, a much smaller size split second. Well, to begin with, they don't make a lot of just normal split second They don't. Right? No, you're absolutely the, right. The, the model that everyone kind of refers to is the 5004, which is a perpetual calendar split second chronograph. Yeah. Using well, they, they upgraded that to the 5204, right. which was a slightly larger case size. A couple of years back, they also launched um, the 5959 as well, which was yes. using a Victorian Piguet Evoche, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, but this is different because they launched a just a pure split second chronograph Right, using their in-house movement, um, almost as a celebration. To me, it's a celebration of yep. the split-second chronograph because there it is in all its purity. And what a stunning dial. And I like the fact that the split-second button is incorporated into the winding crown, yes. which is very old-school Patek. The original strap was black, which gives it a very serious looking feel. Right. Um, I like to wear a lot of browns. So I like I put, the honey. Yeah, yeah I put the, the, the honey strap on it. I think it just lightens up the watch a lot more Absolutely stunning. and makes it more everyday friendly. So maybe we can go from here um, after we've talked about two chronographs, two very iconic chronographs, yeah. to another icon of Patek Philippe, which is the world time. Yes. Yes. Because you've got quite an interesting one. I'm just not a big fan of having too much on my dial. Yeah. But over the years, I've seen that the, uh, the, the rose gold, the yellow gold, and the white gold version of this watch has almost become iconic in many yeah, ways. And there's, and there's obviously a story to the, the Patek World Time, which is the, you know, the, the whole mechanism with uh, Louis Cotier yes, and exactly. all of that kind of 
you know, it, it makes it a very, very special watch. It is, you know, when you think of Patek Philippe, there are certain watches that come to mind. Of course, the complications come to mind, but you think of a Calatrava, yes. you think of a Nautilus, yeah. but you also think of the world, world time. time. Exactly. And also, you also think about it, especially in when it pertains to this watch, about the use of metier de art, right? Yes. And in particular, Quasine enamel. Quasine enamel, right. which I find to be absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And I think the the level of intricacy that goes into it, I mean, you know, the people who do it, really, they're, they're very, very special yes. to be able to do something like that and to have that skill set right. to execute flawlessly. Yes. Um, it's just, it, it is really very inspiring. Yeah. It is really very inspiring. It's like having a masterpiece on your wrist. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and, and for those of you who may be wondering, I'm sure you all know, um, I'm sure most of you are much more knowledgeable than I am, I apologize, but Quasone enamel is basically you create the outline of a painting using gold wire, yep. and then you fill in that painting using confa enamel, which then you have to bake at different um, pro uh, stages to get different colors, colors to emerge. Yep. And what you then have is because no piece will be the same, it's a piece unique essentially. Right? Effectively, because you can never have the same. Yes. Uh, well, you'll have very close by, but yes. not, not the same. And that makes a big difference. And, and Paddock has made sort of several different maps to go with the world time. They did a yellow gold one with a map of uh, Europe and the Americas. The Americas. And they did a, a white gold one with an Asia map. Now, but this is the platinum watch. And what map is this, Shari? This is of the North Pole. Wow. Or the, uh, the Arctic Circle, yeah. basically. That's what it's sort of uh, focusing on. So it's sort of a, a top view from there. Stunning. And, and it's quite interesting because platinum is such a, in many ways, a very hard metal, but it's also a very cold metal. Yes. And I yes. think it's very befitting that yes. this is sort of, and you would expect. I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, uh, Panic would put that yes. as sort of the, the signature yes. uh, on the dial of his platinum yes. piece. It's like a very sort of icy and erudite and sophisticated woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. like a snow queen. Yes, or something precisely. Not that we know any of those, but yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I love the best thing about this is I think this, this version, because the other versions came on bracelets, leather bracelets, this version came only on a platinum bracelet, which bracelet. I remember asking Shari, it's like, yeah. Shari, so you've got a 5131 in platinum, oh, with, with on Quaso enamel. Is it the one on the bracelet? And he goes to me, way, it only comes on the bracelet. <laughs> I'm afraid so, yeah, yeah. It but it's, it's true. Which, okay, that, that's a good uh, place for us to transition into another incredibly cool perpetual calendar watch, right? So I would say this watch is probably one of the icons that every man would probably want to have, but then the brand created it in a very interesting material, yeah. you know, uh, and that is? The uh, Audemars Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar in black ceramic. Yeah. So this is what I love about this watch. The fact that it is using a very historical DNA to create something very innovative and very modern. And that's what I love about this watch because it's not only just a perpetual calendar, uh, but it's a perpetual calendar made entirely of black ceramic. Right. AP has had this in their repertoire for, for as long as I can remember. And I absolutely love the Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar. Yes. Very classic Gerald Genta DNA in the design with the added. In fact, they were the only, I think they did their perpetual calendar in the Royal Oak case in the late 70s, yes, early 80s. Precisely. With the Dubois de Praz. Uh, with the Dubois de Praz uh, movement. Yeah. And I have to say, what an amazing watch yes. because it was in effectively the jumbo case, uh, the jumbo bracelet. Yes. So it's a perfect measurement in terms of, you know, being a 39 millimeter case and all yes. of that. And you get it in different materials throughout the years. And you know, I've always loved the fact that this is that was that was sort of the only sporty perpetual calendar Absolutely. around until recently, yes. uh, because now Patek Philippe have also taken out a sporty perpetual calendar. Oh yeah, the 5740, the, the Nautilus 5740. Yes. But till then, I would say uh, there was only one uh, yes. undisputed. King, King in the Royal King, Oak, yes. in, the, in the sport perpetual yeah. calendar wall, and that was the Royal Oak Perpetual. Now, do you like ceramic as a material? Well, ceramic as a material is quite interesting. First of all, an all black watch is very polarizing. Yes. But, yes. you know, in the last 10, 12 years, all black watches have become very popular. Yes. Uh, you know, whether it's sort of customized black watches or right. ceramic black watches. Right. Um, well, you have the first uh, IWC Pilots watch, which was in ceramic. Was ceramic, that? yeah, one of the first ones, the 3705, yes. uh, which is a fantastic watch. Yes. And again, I love that because IWC was very, very innovative Incredibly. of its time Incredibly. to bring out a watch in full ceramic, yes. right? And uh, put a classic Pilots watch movement in there, Pilots yes. chronograph movement in there. And that's what I loved about the AP QP Black Ceramic yes. because 
again, it took the classic Royal Oak Perpetual and put it in a slightly larger case, mm -hmm. but put it in a material so cool. which makes it very, very modern. Yes. But in many ways, it's also very subtle um, in what it's trying to evoke. Um, in, in that is a perpetual calendar, and I think the moon phase on that is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, it's stunning. I was just it's looking at that. It's a beautiful moon phase. It's an evolution right. of what they have, right. and that is what I like about the watch. Yes. Is that you know, it's not just about making something for the sake of making it. There's been a lot of thought that's gone yeah. into it. And they, they took the story to the next level. They took the story but it's to such the next a level. In the same way, way yeah. they took the Royal Oak to the Royal Oak offshore. Yes. Which was very, very relevant to its time. Absolutely. And still is Absolutely. to the point that now it's become iconic. Yes. Right? And and that's the thing. So they've taken their Royal Oak Perpetual calendar, which was a beautiful watch in its own right. They didn't have to do anything with it, yes. but they said that, you know what, we want to take it to the next level. Wonderful. We want to evolve it into what is going to be next. Fantastic. On so, the subject of evolution, um, you know, one of the, the, the people that, that everyone thinks of as evolving the watch industry in such a, uh, a meaningful way is, is uh, our friend Richard Mill. Yes. And you have, in your case, um, I think probably one of the most iconic, if not the most iconic Richard Mill that's ever been created which is the RM008, which is the split-second chronograph uh, tourbillon. Tourbillon, that's right, yes. I've always admired Richard Mille for what they have done. Yes. And what they keep on doing. Because that's true, in many ways, it's true innovation. When, when Richard Mille first sort of started bringing out the watches, I was like, uh, what are we talking about? Right. right? But what is very interesting <laughs> about, about, about his watches, and you know, if you keep in mind that he sort of came into prominence sort of the mid 90s, I would say he's one of those very quintessential and unique watchmakers, watch brands, watch houses, whatever you call it, yes. to come out in that period when the watch world was, I think, having a tough time defining its direction or identity in yeah. many ways. And then, and then Richard came out with very quintessentially motor racing inspired watches, which took a lot of elements from motor racing. Yes, yes. And I found that to be, although I'm not into motor racing, um, well, not. not particularly. I know. Neither am I. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the fact that it right. involved taking components of that and putting it into a, a wristwatch, yes. I found that to be absolutely fascinating. But Charlotte, let me ask you a question. You were saying that you love the fact that he took um, F1 or motorsport inspired you know, details. What would you consider to be one of those details when you look at this watch? Would it be any of the indications or? I think using the base plates. Yeah. And, and yes, of course, if you look at the dial, it's very set out to be quite F1 inspired, yes. isn't it? I mean, you've got the, what do you call the torque indicator, yes. which yes. is great because it prevents you from overwinding the yes. watch. I think that's a great idea. It's it's bits and pieces yes, like this, which makes it the attention detail. If you look at the power reserve indicator, it looks like the dial, Yes. Um, you know, the racing dial on a, um, on a speedometer or something like that. So yes, there, those are the aesthetics, but also the inside has a lot of uh, inspiration from motor racing. Absolutely. And I think that is what attracted me to Richard Meal is because it is just so something so different. Yes. And, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, in many ways, it was sort of unheard of. Well, I think that what was amazing is that previous to that, in general, watches were backwards looking. You know, they were recreating yeah. pocket watches or they were recreating watches from the past. Yeah. Um, in, in the best scenarios with, uh, you know, to create something that became iconic for the future, as in the case of the paddocks. However, in Richard's case, because he started with a blank slate, he wanted to create things that only had a contemporary influence, you know? Yes. And I think that, but he created a visual identity that was so strong and so compelling. Like every man I've ever seen who looks at a Richard Mill for the first time has this almost primal reaction to it. It's like, oh my God, that's so sexy. It, you is, know? it is. And then, and I love what you were saying because like the torque indicator, which gives you the quality of the power of the mainspring, not just how much you have left, but no. how, the torque that it has in there. Yeah. The gear selector for winding neutral or setting, yeah. which is great also for the for the for setting the hands. Um, and then to have a titanium base plate, to have a tourbillon bridge that's in some ways like a suspension arm from a car. I mean, he remember Richard used to take his watch off. Yes. And throw it on the ground to show people that it was shock resistant. Yeah. 
and but now he doesn't have to because Rafael Nadal, for example, wears it. He wears it, it while playing yes. hardcore tennis. Yeah, and All said and done, uh, it is very interesting to know, oh, well, I, which I found out from you uh, in one of your articles where you mention the fact that uh, Julia Papi sort of was inspired by yes. Richard Harbring's uh, split second mechanism yes. and that is exactly what they transformed into the um, the RM8 yes. when they did the movement for so, this. So basically instead of using a, a, a spring bar for the return lever um, Richard used a a, like a coiled spring like you would have in a ballpoint pen, a tiny one yeah. obviously. And that's what they, uh, Julio used in there as well to alleviate the, the retropont drag, the, the drag dreaded retropont drag. 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 Absolutely. All said and done, I think the RM uh, Richard meal today is very iconic in its own ways. Absolutely. Um, not just because of motorsports or, or tennis or whatever you call it, but the fact that it is related to um, Action yes. in general, and I think yes. that that is a that is a pretty interesting thing. Wait, why didn't you tell us about those two Ultramans on your wrist? Ah, Los Hermanos Ultra. <laughs> <laughs> I've been absolutely fascinated by that. Uh, so this is a watch that I picked up yesterday, which I know you have as well, Shari, and I, and Shari and I have a, a burgeoning but very sort of uh, accelerated affection and, uh, and passion for Omega Speedmaster. I'm wearing the original Ultraman, so this absolutely. is a four five point zero one two from nineteen sixty seven. Most of them were delivered. I think they were all delivered in sixty eight. Um, what's cool about this watch? Of, of the 28,000 of this reference, 145.01267, which is the last Speedmaster to have the fabled caliber 321, which is the Lamania 2310, which is the same movement that's in that watch. Yep. Um, of the 28,000 that were made, uh, there's only 3,000 of them that fall within the right movement range. Uh, and from the 3,000 of those watches, there's only 40 to 50 of them which are legitimately Ultramen, which are watches that have this extremely long and interesting orange chronograph hand, which is 18.8 .8 mm long, and was called uh, or dis bespoke this sort of uh, sobriquet because it appeared in The Return of Ultraman. Right? Yep. So I think the creator was a, f uh, was a fan of, uh, of the watch and a fan of Speedmasters. So what was amazing about Omega, and we were talking about how when brands do tributes to their, their history, um, it's always I interesting to see what they come up with. Yeah. I think that they did a beautiful tribute to this watch um, with the new Ultraman, which they released recently. It's the mm -hmm. second Speedy Tuesday watch, yeah. and which almost caused the um, internet to explode in flames sure. when people tried to just you to know, order them. Order yes, exactly. It, yeah. Uh, this watch is amazing as well. I love the fact that they, you know, so one thing I think that people don't really talk about, and it's hard for you to, to understand unless you see them kind of next to each other, is that the Speedmaster dial on the Ultraman is slightly different from the standard Speedmaster dial, and that has a sort of slightly sort of silky, satiny kind of um, finish to it. Finish to it. But they got that exactly right on this watch as well. Um, they use kind of vintage loom, and it's interesting because my watch actually has vintage loom that, actual vintage loom, but it almost perfectly matches the vintage loom of the vintage of, of, of the uh, of the new re edition oh, yeah. yeah of the new re edition yeah. but they made some subtle differences so they put these orange sort of um, dots, dots uh, on the step dial yeah. you know they did a dot over 90 uh, bezel which is very collectible but they did the tachymeter in, in orange. orange and then of course they did the the hidden sort of ultraman in the, in the continuous seconds uh, Absolutely. Um, sub dial which is uh, you see under uv light you see uh, this sort of profile of, uh, of Ultraman, right? Yeah, you do. So again, you know, Omega... And then they wrote the, uh, the, the, is it the Speedmaster, which is written in orange. Yes, yes. Yeah. What I like about it is, is this basically, this watch be became known as the Ultraman, completely independent of Omega. Yeah. It is completely vintage inspired, but those subtle changes... Yes make it a more modern watch. Absolutely. So uh, that's it, guys, for this uh, this episode. Fantastic. Thank, you, Thank you very much, Ray. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure of mine, sir. No, no, absolutely. absolutely.